Hello friends, I welcome you to tonight's sleep story, entitled The Pursuit of the Ideal. The reading is accompanied by the sounds of a cozy fireplace, which will continue an hour past the reading to help you drift to sleep. If you have not yet subscribed, I would encourage you to do so, to be notified of upcoming sleep stories. And now it is time to unwind. Find a place where you can relax, settle into that place and get comfortable. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Nothing else matters now. You can just let yourself go and relax. Take another deep breath. As you exhale, you can feel yourself unwind. And let's get lost in this story. Frida's Snuggery was aglow with the rose-red splendor of an open fire, which was triumphantly warding off the stealthy approaches of the dull grey autumn twilight. Roger and Claire stretched themselves out luxuriously in an easy chair with a sigh of pleasure. Frida, your armchairs are the most comfy in the world. How do you get them to fit into a fellow's kinks so splendidly? Frida smiled at him out of big, owlish eyes that were the same tint as the coppery grey sea upon which the north window of the snuggery looked. Any armchair will fit a lazy fellow's kinks, she said. I'm not lazy, protested Roger. That you should say so, Frida, when I have wheeled all the way out of town this dismal afternoon over the worst bicycle road in Three Kingdoms to see you, pony mate. I like lazy people, said Frida softly, tilting her spoon on a cup of chocolate with a slender brown hand. Roger smiled at her chummily. You are such a comfortable girl, he said. I like to talk to you and tell you things. You have something to tell me today. It has been fairly sticking out of your eyes ever since you came. Now, fess. Frida put away her cup and saucer, got up and stood by the fireplace, with one arm outstretched along the quaintly carved old mantel. She laid her head down on its curve and looked expectantly at Roger. I have seen my ideal, Frida, said Roger gravely. Frida lifted her head and then laid it down again. She did not speak. Roger was glad of it. Even at the moment, he found himself thinking that Frida had a genius for silence. Any other girl he knew would have broken in at once with surprised exclamations and questions and spoiled his story. You have not forgotten what my ideal woman is like, he said. Frida shook her head. She was not likely to forget. She remembered only too keenly the afternoon he had told her. They had been sitting in the snuggery, herself in the ingle nook, and Roger coiled up in his big pet chair that nobody else ever sat in. What must my lady be that I must love her? He had called it. Well, I will paint my dream love for you, Frida. She must be tall and slender, with chestnut hair of wonderful gloss, with just the suggestion of a ripple in it. She must have an oval face, colorless ivory in hue, 
with the expression of a Madonna, and her eyes must be passionless, peaceful blue, deep and tender as a twilight sky. Frida, looking at herself along her arm in the mirror, recalled this description and smiled faintly. She was short and plump, with a piquant, irregular little face, vivid tinting, curly, unmanageable hair of ruddy brown, and big grey eyes. Certainly, she was not his ideal. When and where did you meet your lady of the Madonna face and twilight eyes? she asked. Roger frowned. Frida's face was solemn enough, but her eyes looked as if she might be laughing at him. I haven't met her yet. I've only seen her. It was in the park yesterday. She was in a carriage with the Mendersons. So beautiful, Freda. Our eyes met as she drove past, and I realized that I had found my long-sought ideal. I rushed back to town and hunted up Pete Mendelssohn at the club. Pete is a donkey, but he has his ways of being useful. He told me who she was. Her name is Stephanie Gardiner. She is his cousin from the south and is visiting his mother. And Freda, I am to dine at the Mendelssohn's tonight. I shall meet her. Do goddesses and ideals and Madonnas eat? said Freda in an odd whisper. Her eyes were suddenly laughing now. Roger got up stiffly. I must confess, I did not expect that you would ridicule my confidence, Freda, he said frigidly. It is very unlike you, but if you are not interested, I will not bore you with any further details. And it is time I was getting back to town anyhow. When he had gone, Frida ran to the west window and flung it open. She leaned out and waved both hands at him over the spruced hedge. Roger, Roger, I was a horrid little beast. Forget it immediately, please, and come out tomorrow and tell me all about her. Roger came. He bore Frida terribly with his raptures, but she never betrayed it. She was all sympathy, or at least as much sympathy as a woman can be, who must listen while the man of men sings another woman's praise to her. She sent Roger away in perfect good humor with himself and all the world. Then she curled herself up in the snuggery, pulled a rug over her head, and cried. Roger came out to Lowlands oftener than ever after that. He had to talk to somebody about Stephanie Gardiner, and Frida was the safest vent. The pursuit of the ideal, as she called it, went on with vim and fervor. Sometimes Roger would be on the heights of hope and elation. The next visit he would be in the depths of despair and humility. Frida had learned to tell which it was by the way he opened the snuggery door. One day when Roger came he found six feet of young men posing at ease in his particular chair. Frida was sipping chocolate in her corner and looking over the rim of her cup at the intruder just as she had been wont to look at Roger. She had on a new dark red gown and looked vivid and rose-hued. She introduced the stranger as Mr. Grayson and called him Tim. They seemed to be excellent friends. Roger sat bolt upright on the edge of a fragile, gilded chair, which Frida kept to hide a shabby spot in the carpet, and glared at Tim until the latter said goodbye and lounged out. You'll be over tomorrow, said Frida. Can't I come this evening? he pleaded. 
Frida nodded. Yes, and we'll make taffy. You used to make such delicious stuff, Tim. Who is that fellow, Frida? Roger inquired crossly as soon as the door closed. Frida began to make a fresh pot of chocolate. She smiled dreamily, as if thinking of something pleasant. Why, that was Tim Grayson, dear old Tim. He used to live next door to us when we were children, and we were such chums, always together, making mud pies and getting into scrapes. He is just the same old Tim, and is home from the West for a long visit. I was so glad to see him again. So it would appear, said Roger grumpily. Well, now that dear old Tim is gone, I suppose I can have my own chair, can I? And do give me some chocolate. I didn't know you made taffy. Oh, I don't. It's Tim. He can do everything. He used to make it long ago. And I washed up after him and helped him eat it. How is the pursuit of their deal coming on, Roger boy? Roger did not feel as if he wanted to talk about the ideal. He noticed how vivid Frida's smile was and how lovable were the curves of her neck, where the dusky curls were caught up from it. He had also an inner vision of Frida making taffy with Tim, and he did not approve of it. He refused to talk about the ideal. On his way back to town, he found himself thinking that Frida had the most charming, glad little laugh of any girl he knew. He suddenly remembered that he had never heard the ideal laugh. She smiled placidly, he had raved to Frida about that smile, but she did not laugh. Roger began to wonder what an ideal without any sense of humor would be like when translated into the real. He went to Lowlands the next afternoon and found Tim there, in his chair again. He detested the fellow, but he could not deny that he was good-looking and had charming manners. Frida was very nice to Tim. On his way back to town, Roger decided that Tim was in love with Frida. He was furious at the idea. The presumption of the man. He also remembered that he had not said a word to Frida about the ideal. And he never did say much more. Perhaps because he could not get the chance. Tim was always there before him, and generally outstayed him. One day, when he went out, he did not find Frida at home. Her aunt told him that she was out riding with Mr. Grayson. On his way back, he met them. As they cantered by, Frida waved her riding whip at him. Her face was full of warm, ripe, kissable tints. Her loose love locks were blowing about it, and her eyes shone like grey pools mirroring stars. Roger turned and watched them out of sight behind the firs that cupped lowlands. And that night, at Mrs. Crandall's dinner table, somebody began to talk about Frida. Roger strained his ears to listen. Mrs. Kitty Carr was speaking. Mrs. Kitty knew everything and everybody. She is simply the most charming girl in the world when you get really acquainted with her, said Mrs. Kitty, with the air of having discovered and patented Frida. She is so vivid and unconventional and lovable. Spirit and fire and dew, you know. Tim Grayson is a very lucky fellow. Are they engaged? Someone asked. Not yet, I fancy. But of course, it is only a question of time. 
Tim simply adores her. He is a good soul and has lots of money. So he'll do. But really, you know, I think a prince wouldn't be good enough for Frida. Roger suddenly became conscious that the ideal was asking him a question of which he had not heard a word. He apologized and was forgiven. But he went home a very miserable man. He did not go to Lowlands for two weeks. They were the longest, most wretched two weeks he had ever lived through. One afternoon, he heard that Tim Grayson had gone back west. Mrs. Kitty told him mournfully. Of course, this means that Frida has refused him, she said. She is such an odd girl. Roger went straight out to Lowlands. He found Frida in the snuggery and held out his hands to her. Frida, will you marry me? It will take a lifetime to tell you how much I love you. But the ideal? questioned Frida. I have just discovered what my ideal is, said Roger. She is a dear, loyal, companionable little girl, with the jolliest love and the warmest, truest heart in the world. She has starry gray eyes, two dimples, and a mouth I must and will kiss. There, there, there. Frida, Frida, tell me you love me a little bit, although I've been such a besotted idiot. I will not let you call my husband that is to be names, said Frida, snuggling down into the curve of his shoulder. But indeed, Roger boy, you will have to make me very, very happy to square matters up. You have made me so unutterably unhappy for two months. The pursuit of the ideal is ended, declared Roger.